God, I thank you for this tremendous opportunity that you have given me this morning. I pray, God, for clarity of mind, clarity of speech. I pray your Holy Spirit would minister to us individually. But not only individually, but Lord, I pray that there'd be a corporate sense of the very presence of God in leading and directing us. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have to unfold and unpack the Scriptures and find out what they're saying to us. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that enables us to do the work that He's called us to do. Thank you, God, that you empower me this morning to do what you've called me to do. Thank you for the privilege. In the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. You may be seated. January and February of this month, I've entitled it kind of a reboot month, New Year's restart, New Year's kickstart. So first we looked at Elijah for two weeks, and I, I entitled about those two messages when desperation meets God. It was a call for God dependency, a call upon Him and lean into Him and not upon our own understanding. And then we looked at Nehemiah for two weeks, and I entitled those two messages, Happy New Ear, that, that the God would not only speak and we'd not only just receive it as information, it would just kind of get here, but it would get into the inner portion of our ears, into the, not just the mental space, but right inside where there is balance and where there is motion. Now, this morning, I want to begin looking at Isaiah for two weeks, and next Sunday, I'll continue to look at him and wrap this whole uh, this, this, uh, series up. I'm entitled this morning, The Watch Call. It's a call to the wall. It's a call for you to go to the wall in prayer and intercession. Now, here's why. You know, so I think I want to back up just a little bit, and I want to read to you Isaiah. Just kind of set the stage for where I'm going this morning. Isaiah chapter 6, and we're going to read verse 1 to down to verse 8, I guess. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling one to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me! What else could he do? Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And here's what the Lord did. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Here's why I love this man, Isaiah. Because in verse 6, or chapter 6 and verse 8, we read that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit said, Who will go for us? He's still calling. The Trinity is still calling out. Who will go for us? Who will speak for us? Who can we send? And I love Isaiah because he pipes up in verse 8 and says, Here am I, send me. And I love what he says because I know how hard it is to say yes to God. Anyone else with me? We all know that it's hard at times to say yes. It's not always easy. It's easier because we live in this earthly tabernacle. It's easier for us to be a Jonah. It's easier for us to say no. It's easier for us to run away. And I've had two runaway experiences, two Jonah-like experiences. The first one was ages 14 to 18. In brackets, I call that the BBC. That's before Bible college. And then after Bible college, I mean, you know, I'm a slow learner. I'm a slow learner. Two years, ages 23 to 24, I call that the ABC, after Bible college. I ran again for two years. When is it ever going to get through to my head? I don't know. I was reading this this morning, and I thought this described me. Caution, content's hot. 70% of this container is air. I thought, that, that describes me. A lot of it's just air. When is it going to get through? How many have you ever seen that on there before? Now you really know. 70% of what I share is just plain air. But Isaiah said yes to a very, and that's what I like. He said yes to a very difficult assignment. He said yes to being a prophet. He said yes to speak for God in and out of season. He said yes 
to speak for God and post those verbal messages for the Lord. He said yes to speak out loud and clear, be it good or be it bad. Isaiah was not called, we got to get it straight, Isaiah was not called to tickle people's ears. He was not called to comfort people's ears. He was called to deliver truth. That's what God said, deliver truth. And sometimes, how many know, sometimes truth disturbs people. I have to admit to you, sometimes I don't like truth. Sometimes I don't like what I read in the Bible because somehow there's a finger put on me, Gary, this is truth. You've got to change. And we know the flesh likes to be like Jonah. I want to run from truth. It disturb, But it's got to disturb before it transformed. It's got to uproot before it can transform our lives. So, so Isaiah was not called to tickle and comfort people's ears. An easier response would have be, been for Isaiah would have been, Oh, here am I, but dear God, send somebody else. I mean, I'm in the zone. I'm in the church gathering. I'm at the conference, but dear God, they're not speaking about me. Dear Lord, you're not speaking about me. Send somebody. Send the guy sitting next to me, but I don't want to do that kind of stuff. That would have been easier, much easier. Much easier for Isaiah to say, but God, whenever you want someone to sound out, oh, the blessings of God are coming down from a father above, then you can count me in. (laughs) You can count me in. I'll run with that message. I'll run to the nations. I'll run to the people. But if it's cursings, I'm gone for lunch. I can't hear too good. It's easier to say no. And I love Isaiah because he said, send me. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. See, my New Year's message now begins to take a bit of a shift. These last two have a missions flavor to them. It's not about you. It's not about you being desperate for God. It's not about your personal prayer life. I spoke about those already. Those Those are the bases. That's the beginnings. We talked about that. We know we should be desperate. We know we should be praying. But this has got this missions flavor to it. It's not about you. It's not for your benefit, but it's so others will benefit. See, before Isaiah was commissioned to go, he was consumed by the fire. He was melted. He was shaped. He was molded in that kind of furnace, so to speak, setting, which I just read about. It was hot in the temple. There was smoke. There was an altar. There was fire. And Isaiah was consumed by it. See, God was molding him. God was shaping him at the furnace. God was grooming him, and he had a mission focused for him. He had a purpose for his life are the three greatest words Isaiah spoke before. Now, when he said, here am I, send me, those are great words, aren't they? But there's even greater words that Isaiah spoke before that. Here they are. Here are the three. Woe is me. Those were great words that Isaiah said. He lowered himself. Whenever you get to an altar, whenever you get before God's throne, whenever you get to the place where there's the fire of God's presence and his power and his might, you want to get down low. There's no way that you want to highly exalt yourself. There's no way you want to climb up the totem pole, but you want to be like the children sang this morning. They got down on their face. That's what you want to do. And I'll get dizzy there. That's what you want to do when, just joking, just wanted you to feel for me. That's what you want to do when you get in the presence of God. They said at Andre Crouch's funeral, and I, I love the, the man that said this. He said, there's too much arrogance in the church today. And should I gain any praise, let it go to Calvary. And he said, there's just too much arrogance. But when you get in the presence of God, arrogance goes. Pride goes. The smell of man is burnt off. And you get down low. And you say, whoa, 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 whoa. And whoa some more. Woe is me. God says, I love that kind of position. He liked that position. Isaiah was in, woe is me. He was not puffing himself up, but he was getting down. He had been to the melting pot. He'd seen how small he was, and he'd seen how big God is. Now God said, I can use him. But we all need to join Isaiah at the furnace. We all need to join Isaiah at the altar. We all need a little heat from time. I don't know about you, but I need it from time to time, a lot of the time. We all need a little live coal placed upon our lips. We all need a little surrender. We all need a little humility. We all need a little proper perspective of who we are 
We all need an altar experience to fire us up, to burn us up, and then we qualify. Then we are equipped to be sent. You try to do it any other way, and you'll fumble and you'll fall. You try to raise yourself up, God will lower you somehow. But you lower yourself up, or you lower yourself, as the Bible says, He will raise you up. If there's any raising to be done, let God do it, not man. How many think that's a good place to say amen? I think so. What was I talking about? My message is a call to watchmanship. And I thought this past week, this is, first I wanted to say it's a deeper level, but then I said, no, Gary, I don't think that's right. We're not talking about a deeper level of prayer, but we're talking about a side move. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about a broadening aspect of prayer. We're just going out further. We're expanding the tent. You know what Isaiah talks about that? Expanding the tent pegs, enlarging our circle of love. That's what we're doing now. It's not deeper. It's a sidestep. It's a side movement. We're broadening our aspect of prayer to encourage and enlarge and include other people. Isaiah chapter 62 And verse 6 and 7. Isaiah speaks for God. As I said, he's he's a prophet. He's an announcer for the Lord. And in speaking for God, he says this. I have posted watchmen on your walls, Jerusalem. They will never be silent day or night. You who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest. And give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. I have posted watchmen on your walls. I used to have a watchdog. I had four, Ger- four German shepherds. The fourth one I've had, man, he, she, was, she was something. A watchdog. She was so good that she needed another assignment. She needed something bigger than the two acres we were giving her. But she, here's what she was like. If she She would, uh, we'd have out front of our home and we'd have a nice coffee, my wife and I, in the mornings, some mornings, and, "Ah, come on, Miko, let's have some coffee together and sit down and, no, she's pacing back and forth. She's watching, but she's looking over our two acres. She's looking at the street. If she sees a leaf fall off a tree, she's growling and barking. She wants to attack it. Miko, it's not a life. It's just a leaf. Relax, settle down. But I realized she needed another assignment. So I, now she resides, at least I think she does, I haven't heard from her. She resides somewhere in Nipua. More acres to guard, more things to watch over. And all I said to the new owner was, if it doesn't work out, I said this last July and I haven't heard from him yet. If it doesn't work out, call me. I got his number, but I've never called. I can't do it. If I call, you know, it digs things up. She's a good watchdog, but she needed more territory. She needed a bigger assignment, so she's gone on. To that bigger, bigger acreage. You think I'm going to say, it's gone on to that bigger acreage in the sky, didn't you? Well, maybe. Ah, move on. But she was a watchdog, always alert, always watching, observing, observing, never relaxing, never settling down. God said this, I have posted watchmen on your walls. They're like watchdogs. They see flies and fleas at 100 yards. Well, maybe not that much, but they do see good. This is not a sightseeing watch. It's not a bird watching tour. You know, when you get on those green shorts. <laughs> it's a green? Green shorts and binoculars and walk around looking really nice. And they're bird watching. This is not about getting up high in a tree and watching birds. Oh, how beautiful they are, as good as they are. It's not about a high place to set up an easy chair and sit down and relax. It's not like a vacationing high in the Alps. It's not like a flight over the Grand Canyon. Oh, the oohs and the ahs, beautiful. No, no, that's not what this is all about. This is a high place where high, alert, and sensitive and piercing activity takes place. Now, Israel, down through the years, has always had their enemies, kingdoms, trying to take them down, take them over. Historically, the city of Jerusalem had high, thick walls that surrounded the city, and positioned on top of these walls were the watchmen. They were assigned a position. There they stood. There they watched. The word watchman in the Hebrew means this, to lean over, to peer into the distance, to to spy out. 
to wait for, to keep the watch. There was not a place for the sleepy-eyed and impaired vision people. Not a place for lazy people who just want to kind of put in time and then mark in and mark out and get out and get on with life. Not a place for daydreamers. God said, I have posted them. I have placed them on the wall. You can be sure that they're on the walls. God has always seen to it down through the years, through the pages of the Old Testament, God has always had his watchmen in place. God has always had people that were willing to stand up and say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, send me to the wall. Send me to my post. Oh, God, use me. I want to go there. I want to be there. I want to walk the beat. I want to take the night shift and stay up while others are getting the rest. I will keep my eyes peeled. I'll look for anything unusual, and I'll report it back. I'll climb up higher so I can see better. I'll always be ready to sound the alarm. I'll be willing to take a risk. I'll be willing to set myself up and be exposed. Anybody willing to be a watchman? The great watchmen are always popping up in the Bible. Noah. Noah comes to my mind. Daniel come to, comes to my mind. Ezekiel comes to my mind. Jeremiah comes to my mind. Moses comes to my mind. They had great eyesight, and some way and somehow in their life, God saw that they could be used, and somewhere, somehow, and it all was different for each one, they said, yes, God, use me. They went to the wall, became watchmen, so to speak. Noah was preaching righteousness, a preacher of righteousness. Daniel saw pictures, and he saw the writing on the wall. Jeremiah did a whole lot of crying. He went through an awful lot of Kleenex. Moses was interceding with sights on the promised land. Ezekiel saw the dry bones in the desert and that they could live. Oh, they jumped up and they jumped into the gap. When God said, will you go? They said, yes, I'll go. Here am I. Send me to the wall. Send me to the wall. Send me to the wall. So today, I've just shared with you Old Testament. I gave you a picture but here we sit this morning. Here I am. February 1, 2015. What does this mean to me? We're sitting in New Testament times. We're sitting in a New Testament church. And we're praying God give us a New Testament application. That was my prayer. That was my calling last Monday morning. What I was calling out to God for. God give us a New Testament application. I believe we could say, here's the shift. The shift is from watch man, you can put in brackets there, selected, to watch people, everyone. See, today, it's not a question of, is God calling me to be a watchman? We can get bogged down in that. We can spend days and months and years praying that. Are you calling me? That's the wrong prayer. God has already answered the prayer. That's not the question, is God calling me to be a watchman? It's not a question of qualifying and special giftings. Oh, am I gifted? And it is it within my abilities? If we pray that kind of a prayer, chances are we can also come up with a lot of excuses. Well, I'm not this way. I'm not that way. And I, 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 I'm antsy. I don't stop long enough to pray. I'm, God, you know me. God is saying, chill. God is telling me to chill right now. Chill. That's not the question. It's not a question of qualifying. This means we can cop out. The question is, have I answered the call that's already been given? That is what we have to consider. It's a question of availability. It's a question of desire. God has already answered it. This means we all can go to the wall. Every one of us from the younger to the older. All of us can go to the wall. The word today is watch people. And it's what God's, all God's children are called to do. The moment I believe we're saved, the moment we find Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, God says, now I want you to become a watchman. You don't have to go deep. You just got to go sideways. You got to include others. Watchman. It's my calling as a leader. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17 tells me that I'm to watch over you. But I'm to have your best, I'm to have your best interest at heart. Not mine. It's me. It's not important here. It's about you. 
It's about the body of Christ. It's about the church. It's not about me. It's not about my agenda. God said, I'm to watch over the flock. God says, I'm to give leadership to the sheep. It's not my agenda. I'm to watch. Maybe that's why there's platforms, so I can get see you better. I don't know. Just a thought. It's also the eldership and the leaders calling of our church. Paul said to the Ephesian church leadership, Acts 20, 28, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God. That's to the leadership, the eldership, a responsibility to go to the wall, to watch and to pray, to watch and to pray and to work. It's a congregational family calling. Paul said to the congregation in Rome, in Romans chapter 16, verse 17, he said, watch out for those. Watch out for those who cause divisions. Watch out for those who put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teachings you have learned. Keep away from them. Pretty straightforward. He said to the church, you've got to watch for those ones. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, Paul speaks about restoring our brother or sister caught in a sin and then watching that we ourselves don't fall in the same temptation. Watch it because it's vital, it's important. There's a ripple effect, he's saying. We have a relationship one with another. We affect each other. Watch it. Watch others and watch yourself. To Timothy, Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16, watch your life and watch your doctrine closely. If you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers, all those that associate with you. There's a group dynamics, a group dynamics. Watch, watch, watch. See, the call today is for watch people. It's a spiritual duty to ourselves and to our church. Where do we watch? Where to watch for any signs of disturbance? Watch and pray, watch and pray. Watch for any signs of disunity. Watch for any signs of dissension. Watch for any signs of division. Watch for any signs of distraction. Watch for any signs of devices. Watch for any signs of discord, discouragement, disabling, discord, disorder. I said the other one already. Get it right, Gary. Dis- I like the D's here. How many know that I went through the dictionary and find out every word I could find with D's? Watch for those things. Disunity. Watch for breaches. Watch for cracks in the walls and the mission of the church. As Jesus said, we got to watch and pray. Watch and pray. Take everything to God in prayer. Watch and pray as you usher. Watch and pray as you lead a small group. Watch and pray as you lead a ministry. Watch and pray as you teach in a BG club. Watch and pray as you're involved in Focus and Gap. Watch and pray as you teach in kids' church. Watch, pray, work. Watch, pray, work. Doesn't that sound like a good slogan? Sounds like a song we could sing or chanting. Watch, pray, work. What? I'll do it alone. It's okay. I don't mind standing up by myself. Watch, pray, work. Watch. If you say that fast enough, watch, pray, work. Watch, prayer. Watch, prayer, work. I get it. Isn't that nice? You thought I just made that up, and I said it already once this morning. Watch prayer work. (laughs) It hit me in my office when I put this together. I said, wow, I had a wow moment. Watch prayer work. Watch pray work. Watch. Okay, I said it enough. I think I'm finally getting it after all these years in ministry. Finally getting it. Why? Why on earth are watch people vital in the church? Why? I read something. I read something in my Bible. It's found in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Be alert. Be of sober mind. It just means watch. Your enemy... The devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the... I don't know how else you can stand firm in the faith unless you pray. Because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. 
Now, I, I'm a firm believer in lighting a candle in the darkness. But I'm also a realist. I also know the devil is prowling around. I also know the enemy is trying to find any cracks he can find in a church mission, or in a church fellowship. I also know that he, he likes to divide. If he can divide, he can conquer. If he can divide, he can destroy. He can ruin. And the Bible tells us that we're to watch and that we're to be alert because he's not on vacation. He's like a hungry, roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That is why we need watch people. People that will go to the wall for the church. Go to the wall for the mission. Go to the wall for its purpose. Stand in the gap and say, I believe in its mission. I believe in its being available. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe that God transforms people. I'm going to go to the wall for my church. I'm going to pray for my church. Believe in my church. Pray for the pastors. Pray for the leaders. Pray for the ministries. Go to the wall. In Nehemiah, we read that the enemy heard that there was a rebuilding of the walls in Jerusalem. Didn't like it. Didn't like the, you know, the, the reviving process. The revival. What? There's life there. Something's happening. Do you know something? I, I sat around a table one time at a meeting in Thompson many, many years ago. I don't know what the meeting was about, but I remember this man from the city say, making a statement, a general statement about the churches in Thompson. Well, he said the churches in Tom, the churches here are doing nothing anyways. This little pastor is sitting at the table. I just wanted to be like Jesus there and uproot the table, spill everything over in such a righteous and spiritual way, of course. But it hurt me deep inside. I've never forgotten it. The churches aren't doing nothing anyways. The churches are called to do something. And I wanted to jump up and say, I beg to differ. All it did was stoke me. God, if you're calling me to do something, I'm going to do it because I believe the church is the greatest life-changing agent on the face of the earth. And so, God, if you want me to call me into the gap for X amount of time, I'll do it. Take me to the wall. And so Nehemiah said in chapter 4, verse 9, we prayed. You know, the enemy came in full force to fight against us. And they wanted to stir up trouble. They wanted progress to stop. Nehemiah said, we prayed to our God and we posted a guard day and night to meet the threats. Watch people were on the scene. Every person in our church can be a watch person. You know, we can be part of the mission. We can say, I believe what the church is doing. So we pray for the pastors. We pray for the board. We pray for those in leadership. We watch and we pray and we work. Watching and praying is not mentioned as one of the gifts. There's lots of gifts mentioned in the Bible. Corinthians, Romans, Ephesians, gifts. You won't find watching and praying in there. It's not a gift. It's an instruction for all believers. You say, where do I start? You start with a minute. Start with a minute. Don't worry about time. We get caught up. Oh, I can't pray. I can't pray long. It's okay. Just start with a minute. Dear God, I pray for the church. I pray for its mission. And if you want something to pray for a minute, look, every bulletin, every newsletter, we put one of our visions. There are six visions that basically guide and direct our church. This is vision number three here this Sunday. It's missions focused. Pray that. And don't forget to pray for continual unity. You all, we'll always need that. Every church needs that. I think I'm done. Stand. Oh, dear Lord, I pray this morning 
fresh, fresh fire that would just burn in my life. It starts with me. Every one of us needs to come before the Lord and say, but it starts first with me. Not with my brother, not my sister, but as the chorus said, not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me. And God, I thank you that you have chosen to use us, that you haven't saved us to sit. We're not saved to sit, but saved to serve. We're saved to work. We're saved to be doers. That's the most exciting place to be. Be doers, doers, not just hearers only. Help us, God, as a church. Help us, God, as a denomination. Help us, God, to reach our world. Help us, God, not to sit still. Help us, God, to know that we're all called to the wall. Will we go to the wall on behalf of our church? Will we go to the wall on behalf of our vision and our mission? Will we go to the wall is the question. If you're here this morning and you'd like someone to pray for you, I invite you just to make your way down to the front and we'll pray for you in your need. Thank you for coming today. You're dismissed.